there we go yeah there we go um yeah now we are recording so um so yeah okay like i'm going to quickly rewind over here so we are talking about local trocozoa today right and we are going to talk about uh, several phyla within that particular group right and then uh, here we are looking at their phylogenetic tree right so um and the low Lophotrochozoans, that particular clade, right, is over here, right, guys. You know, like uh, whenever you see something wrong, you do please speak up because it's uh, harder for me to see your chat coming through, right. So this is actually my group um, that we are going to talk about today. Now there are what kind of characters do we see in them, right? Two characters, two unique features that I want you to know in that particular group. One. They actually have a trochophore larvae, not any larvae, not having just a larval stage, having a trochophore larvae. Second one is having a particular structure called a lophophore that is helpful in feeding. Right now, those are the two characteristics you are going to learn. Now, you know what happens to these ancestral features that evolved deep in that particular group, right? For this particular group, this low having the lophophore and the tro having trochophore larvae evolved in the ancestor, ancestor of that particular group, right? So as different phyla evolves, evolved from that particular ancestor, certain things happen to that, th th those two characteristic features, right? So in certain groups, they actually preserved both of them, right? In certain groups, they actually modified their loaf for the feeding structure, or they completely lost it. Um, it underwent uh, residence, right? Uh, and, and some groups completely modified it and some groups still have it. So keep that in your mind. Now, what are the other characters? You know, see even further ancestral characters, right? Like all the animal traits, do lophotrochophosoans uh, show um, that particular ancestral character? Like animal traits, basic animal traits, like multicellularity, able to move, uh, all of that. Yes, they do, right? But I'm not going to go over them because that's a very ancestral character. Same thing regarding other features like having true tissues, uh, bilateral symmetry. All of those are actually, you know, ancestral characters that evolved at deeper nodes in the phylogenetic tree, right? Um, so again, this having the lophophore and the trochophore larvae, right? That is an ancestral trait for lophotrochozoans, right? But within the entire animal kingdom, that can be considered a derived trait, shared derived trait or a synapomorphic feature. It's extremely important to understand how to, uh, that that these two words, you know, those uh, the characterization of those traits depends on where you are on the phylogenetic tree and what group you are referring to. And by the way, all of those notes I explained, you know, you can actually, I, I do see some of you are, you know, listening, some of them are taking notes. Um, make sure that these things end somewhere, right? Particularly in your lab notebook is the best place to put these things, right? Um, and now let's talk about the first group, Pratihilminthes. Um, plat means flat. Helminth means worms, right? So this group consider, includes tapeworms, planarians, flukes. Um, now, when it comes to plats, what, are, what kind of characteristics are we talking about? Mm, they are flat, right? They're like the name says, they are flat. Those are ventrally flattened creatures. Um, they don't have a coelom. Right, they are a coelomic. They don't have a body cavity. Now, again, look at the logic. If they had a body cavity, that body cavity requires a space, right? So they will actually not be flattened if they had a body cavity, right? And then, yes, they are bilaterally symmetrical. Look back at into your um, tree of life, the animal phylogenetic tree. Bilateral symmetry evolved several nodes deep in that particular tree. Um, Gastrovascular cavity may be present. Yeah, some of them actually do not have a digestive system or a gastrovascular system or a gastrovascular tube, right? When they have it, that's incomplete, right? So they do not have a complete digestive tract. When they have it, it is incomplete. Some of them do not have a digestive system at all. They are triploblastic. They have three germinal layers. Um, now, in terms of systems, I said, some of them might have a gastrovascular system, but otherwise, like they don't show a circulatory system. They are simple flat bodies. Why do they require some system to circulate stuff? 
um, respiratory system again. They are small bodies, flat bodies. They don't require a system to circulate gases. Um, reproductive system, that's an interesting one, right? They do have a reproductive system. They have very elaborate, well-developed reproductive system. Um, they have a body covering, which is actually a single cell layer, right, in thickness. And on top of that single cell layer, they could have another extra cuticle, extra protection layer, right? But in terms of cell thickness, it's a, sing it's a single cell layer, right, a simple epithelium. Um, the parasitic forms, right, there are lots of parasitic worms in Platyhelminthes group, those parasitic ones have larval stages. The free living forms do not, okay? So they are really interesting features. Um, so what kind of groups are we going to talk about in terms of um, Platyhelminthes? I want you to know this, these four groups, right? The top cestodes, right, are actually the tapeworms. Right, the ones that are fully parasitic, they are gut parasites, okay? And then we have turbularia, right? Which is actually the free living form, the only free living form of Platyhelminthes. Um, and planaria or dugesia is actually the one of the most common form and some really cool uh, colorful forms, aquatic forms also uh, have been documented, are known to science and then uh, another parasitic form is trematodes. They are called flukes, right? Um, and these guys are not usually find, found in the gastric tube, in your digestive tube. They rather reside on your other organs, right? Like in liver. So you can say, mm, that is, isn't that actually part of the digestive system? Yeah, kind of, but they are not in a tube. They are not in a lumen, right? Um, they actually kind of... Uh, live themselves inside um, body organs. And, and some flukes are also found in your circulatory system, right? So they are not just limited to digestive system at all. Um, in certain cases, we have found flukes on the digestive system's wall, not in the tube, on the wall of the tube. The last group, monogena, are actually a very interesting group because they only parasitize. You want to make a guess? Where do you think they, uh, what do they, what do you think they parasitize? What kind of hosts? And where do you, what organs do you think they live on? Can you judge based on my photographs? Um, possibly gills. Very good. Only, only found in gills, right? Um, gills of fish. Now moving on. Those are the classes, turbularia, they are free living. And the cool thing about them is they actually have a pharynx. The pharynx that you have inside of you, these guys can actually protrude it. It's extensible, right? And they use that for feeding purposes. Um, and they also have an incomplete gastrovascular system, right? G-V-C, gastrovascular cavity. Um, Trematoda, they are parasitic um, and they, could, they have multiple hosts. They um, feed on actual body tissues, fluids like blood, right? Um, and they too have a digestive system, have an incomplete gastrovascular cavity. Cestoda, it's a parasitic form, and they parasitize many other animals, right? and they live inside the digestive system of another host. They live inside digestive systems of another host. Now that's an interesting thing to uh, you know, uh, get into your brain. If you are parasitizing a digestive system of different hosts, you don't need a digestive system for yourself. What you do is you absorb pre-digested food, right? Or uh, digested food from the host. Right. Um, so because of that, you don't need the digestive system. Right. You can directly absorb whatever the things your ho the, the host uh, ingested. Right. So there's a time between the host digesting food, like you and us, uh, you and me digesting food, and and then absorbing that food. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, oh, ingesting versus absorption. There's a gap. Uh, did someone has a question? What is a GVC? Yeah, gastrovascular cavity. 
right? GVC stands for gastrovascular cavity. Um, so if you are living inside a host, you don't need one for yourself, right? And you are going to just keep sucking food up. So what I was going to say is, us, you know, most of us who, you know, heterotrophs that, you know, eat stuff, there's a time between eating stuff and actually them being absorbed, quite a lengthy time, right? Hours, it could be. So these parasites make use of that extra time that you need to absorb the food you ate, right? And and now, do what do you guys think? Do you guys think they actually, you know, you, you can actually shake your head if it is a no and nod if you think it's a yes. Um, do you think they actually, cestodes tap into your bloodstream? Do you think they actually kind of attack your uh, digestive system wall and drink blood? What do you guys think? Do they drink, do cestodes drink their host blood? Any of you don't want to answer? Do not know, that's okay. No, not knowing is okay. Now, remember very well, they will not tap into your bloodstream. They can latch onto your gut wall right? They have structures for that. They can suck onto your gut wall, but they will not drink stuff out of it, right? They don't have a structure to do that. So keep that in your mind very well. Um, Monogena well, mentioned that they are fish parasites um, and they do also have a, a, an incomplete gastrovascular system or a gastrovascular cavity. Um, all right. So cystodes are the only group who do not have a gastrovascular system, right? None of them have a complete gastrovascular system. It's always incomplete. And then what do you mean by incomplete? Meaning they have a mouth, but they don't have an anus, right? So the gastrovascular cavity is not actually a tube rather, uh, or a blindly ending tube, right? Which does not like, you know, um, have an anus to exclude stuff they cannot digest. The reason, if you wonder why don't they have one, um, I have two reasons. Well, most of those are parasites. So if you are a parasite, you can make use of everything you take up, you uptake from your mouth. That's one reason. Second reason is actually, this is dis going to sound extremely disgusting. For planarias, for uh, table area, right? They are not parasites, they are free living. Right. So they actually should have a way mechanism to throw away whatever they cannot digest. Guess how they do that? If there's only one opening, they, they have to spew out whatever the un undigested part, right? Or poop out of their mouth, right? So, um, so this is actually an interesting thing I wanted to mention about uh, tapeworms. So tapeworms do have these really weird hooks and suckers that helps them to latch onto their host's gastrovascular cavity wall, but they will not drink blood out of you. And they are quite long. They have these multiple units called proglottids, you know, um, that compresses their body. And if you actually look into a single unit of their body called the proglottid, they look like this. Right, they, they look like that. A single unit has everything they need. They have a complete sets of male and female reproductive systems, right? Um, and also, uh, so because of that, right? Because of the single proglottid have reproductive capacity, they can function as an independent living organism, right? So meaning if you ingested a single proglottid in contaminated food, you will end up having a complete worm. Right, they are extremely well adapted to parasitic mode of life. And so some proglottids are smaller, right? And some proglottids are larger. Now, if you look into a larger proglottid, what you see is that entire proglottid space is taken up by the reproductive system, right? And, um, and if you take actually, you know, certain cases when I have looked into extremely well mature proglottids, all I see is not the reproductive system, all I see is fertilized eggs. That's all I see, right? Like it's filled with tiny, 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 tiny dots, right? So extremely well adapted to parasitic mode of life. Um, now, there is a video link over here. I'm not going to play it right now, unless you want me to explain it later down the road. Um, so 
the video is not 15 minutes, right? So it, it's actually much shorter than that. Um, so again, if you look into this slide over here, right, of this particular animal, right, it's the same animal, this is actually a preserved one. Can you see this particular thing um, on its kind of in the middle of the body? That is actually the pharynx, right? So what they, the pharynx is kept internally, but when they want to feed, Right, as you see in the video, they will actually extrude the pharynx, protrude the pharynx from their mouth to the environment and create creates a suction force to suck all the food through the pharynx into their digestive system. And some of those guys actually, this hammerhead worm is also another example for planarians. They look like a f like completely flat, slimy, um, Earthworm, but they are not an earthworm, right? But they are a planarian. Um, there was a um, few months back, there was like lots of hot news debated like on, you know, on this critter, you know, and people thought it was actually a snake because it's large, um, but it's not a snake and it's not venomous by any means. So um, now, we are looking into the third group within um, the, the, another phylum, right? So we are done with um, Pratihelminthes. Now we are looking at a new phylum, Annelids. We call the, the general name is segmented worms, right? So what are the characteristics uh, that, that you find unique to or characterizing Annelids? They are also bilaterally symmetrical. Now remember, annelids are not the only bilaterally symmetrical animal, right? As an animal, they keep that. They are also triploblastic and they are not the only triploblastic animal. They are coelomic, right? They have a true body cavity as you see in the diagram, right? And the coelom is surrounded by completely mesoderm, right? One of the three germinal layers that makes them triploblastic. Um, and... Because they have a coelom, they are also, um, that coelom can function like a hydrostatic skeleton. Because of that, they can actually maintain a body shape. Because of that, they can move using their hydrostatic skeleton. They are truly segmented. Now, do remember that the platyhelminthes we considered are not truly segmented. They have proglottids, they have those repeatable units, but that's not a true seg body segment, right? So if true body segments cannot function independently without the entire animal, right? That's, a, that, that's actually what sets up a proglottid of a tapeworm from a true body segment, right? True body segments are part of the entire animal's body. They collectively make the animal work. Proglottid, can act independently. So keep that in your mind. Um, so you, if I ask, give me a difference between annelids and platyhelminthes, you can say segmentation. That would be a 100% correct answer. Um, complete digestive tract. Now they have a complete tube-like gastrovascular cavity, right? Starts with the mouth, ends with the anus, right? And so the food flow is unidirectional. They don't have to, you know, throw poop out of their mouth. Um, they have nervous systems, circulatory systems, a closed circulatory system. I will explain what that means later on. And excretory systems to get rid of nitrogenous wastes. Um, and they do have larval stages. Um, classes, well, what groups we have, we are going to talk about uh, three different groups, oligochaeta and polychaeta, right? And the third one is actually hirudinia, which includes, um, Leeches, right? So you can, you're going to ask, okay, can we call that a parasite? Mm, yeah, but an external parasite, right? They live on your body, not in your body, right? So there's a difference between the parasitism of platyhelminthes and the leech parasitism, right? Um, okay, so oligochaetes first, that includes earthworms, right? And uh, and you guys know I'm a, I research on animals, right? I don't study invertebrates quite a lot, but you know I, I do want to point out that some of the earthworms. Can you see how large this earthworm is? Right, it's actually big, right? And and those are tropical giant earthworms. I have seen them in my own life. They are they are actually huge. 
they're actually humongous, that large in terms of their sizes, right? Um, you might mistake it for a snake, but no. Imagine the poor earthworm that you find in your flower pot, right? If you are doing fishing, the one you hook up, you, you buy from the bait shop. Imagine that, that same animal being 100 times larger, right? That's what a giant earthworm looks like. Um, all righty. So they, what kind of characters do, do you see in them, right? They actually, they have these hair-like structures on their body called CT and they're extremely small, right? Um, you may not see them to your naked eye, right? They, 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 you might have to use a microscope to observe the CT of most oligochetes, right? Now, are there CT find in other annelids that are not microscopic? Yes, but if you try to find CT in an earthworm in your flower, you know, from that, that you bought from a bait shop, you might not be able to see it without a microscope, right? Can you see that with a hand lens? <sighs> mm, I do. I wouldn't bet my money on it. No, th those are very, very tiny, very small, right? They're actually hair-like structures that is protruding away from the body, right? You know, like you see in this particular slide. Um, so oligochetes don't have a clear head, right? So they don't have a very distinct head. Like it's harder for you to tell what is the tail end, what is the head end by looking at an earthworm. They also don't have any particular structures coming out of their body other than CT, right? They don't have fleshy arms, parapodia or anything like that. Um, what they have is, okay, I'm telling you things that they don't have, right? Well, what do they have that actually is unique to oligochetes among other annelids is this clitellum. Clitellum is actually, you know, it's, it looks like a ring around the worm, right? And in fact, that helps you to understand where the head is. Clitellum is closer to the head end or the mouth end or the cephalic end or the anterior end than the tail end, right? Or the uh, caudal end or the posterior end, right? So in this poor guy, this is their head that's where, where their mouth is located and that's their anus, right? Um, why do we have to use clitellum? Because they don't have cephalization. They don't uh, have a clear distinct head formation. What is clitellum? It's a ring around their body, right? So what is the point of that is actually it secretes a cocoon, right? Kind of an, uh, a structure uh, like a cocoon that you see in butterflies or moths. Um, and but when they reproduce, you know, you can see when they reproduce like this through copulation, right? And after they exchange sperms, right? Um, sperms and eggs are secreted into this cocoon and then the worm crawls itself out of the cocoon, right? And then the, 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 the I said the cocoon is a ring. So the two open ends of the cocoon fuses. Right? and then making a complete cocoon. And the rest of the development and the fertilization happens inside the cocoon, right? Um, so you may ask the question when you see this thing happening, well, who's the girl, who's the boy? Both, right? A single worm has both male reproductive systems and female reproductive systems, right? So when they fuse, as you see in my um, photograph, um, they exchange right? One inserts um, sperms into the other and receives sperms from the same animal, right? So it's it's actually bidirectional fertilization, right? Nobody acts like the female, nobody just acts like the male. They both act in both ways, right? <laughs> you won't imagine something creepy. Imagine how it looks like when the giant earthworms mate, right? For me, it's actually really cool. Um, Right, so hermaphroditic means when both males and female reproductive systems are found in the same individual. Um, now, other groups, oligochetes, right? Now, earlier we actually had um, Herodinians or um, the, 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 the leeches in a separate group called Herodinia, but now we actually combine earthworms and leeches under oligochaeta, right? But if you read books, when you, you will do some, you know, look, when you look things up, you know, for your homework, you might find 
that uh, some literature, older literature, consider um, these groups as Herodinia, but now we consider them as a subgroup within Oligochaeta, right? Within the same class, Oligochaeta, right? What kind of characteristics do you find among leeches? Um, now they have an two suckers, right? Anterior sucker, posterior sucker, right? Now those suckers, right, help have two functions. Anyone want to make a guess? What what is the use of these uh, suckers? Emily? Stick to their prey. That's one thing. They can stick to their host, right? Other thing, anyone else want to make a guess? Uh, reproduction? Mm, not exactly. No, it does not. How do they move? Have you seen how they move? Yeah, they actually move by measuring. Have you seen those inchworms? Yeah, they, these guys move exactly like that, right? Um, and if you actually look at some of my, uh, I'll try to upload a video on uh, like how do they actually move. Um, they move like an inchworm. So when they move, they actually use their suckers to attach to the substrate, right? So that they don't get thrown away or blown away, right? And it's really cool. Like when they have, have anybody seen how they look for a suitable host to latch onto? They use their posterior sucker to latch onto their substrate. And then they use their, and then kind of like, you know, they erect themselves upright and keep like doing this, right? And then whenever something walks by, beep, they latch onto them, right? Um, so, so suckers are used for locomotion and to attach to their host, the poor bastard, right? Um, how many of you have any mishaps? <laughs> Accidentally, <laughs> one of these landing on you. No experience? Good, because you, you will not get that experience unless, yeah, you, I, I've, I do field work a lot in this part of the country, as well as in the south. Right? I have done a lot in the south. Actually, I've done it a lot in the northern part as well. My experience of them being on my skin is zero. Right? I like I've heard this happening very rarely because you don't find them a whole a lot in the uh, temperate world. Now, don't get me wrong; there are aquatic leeches, but they are extremely rare, and you, you have to be extremely hapless, particularly if you live in a poultry farm, right? If you work in a, a farm, like animal farm, yeah, you know, like, you know, you might actually encounter them more than in the wild, right? But where I worked, uh, you know, we, are, we are currently also do work in tropical environments. Yeah, um, there's a ton of those. So, um, don't know whether I miss those days anymore, <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, yeah. They are, they are extremely uh, common in tropical rainforest environments, okay. Uh, and they actually also show very clear segmentation. You know, the analytes, they should show it, right? And in fact, despite the large uh, or small leeches or despite the size or the length of the leech, right? They always have 34 segments in their body, right? Um, now, in contrast, um, earthworms don't have a conservative number, right? The number of segments in their body vary between species. But for these guys, regardless of the species, it's 34, right? And they do not have those hair-like structures or fleshy limb-like structures coming out of their body. No setae, no parapodia. Parapodia are actually those tiny limbs, right? Limb-like structures, fleshy structures that is coming out of their body. They also have both male and female systems inside them. That's why I call them hermaphrodites. Um, and yes, they're parasitic. Um, external parasites. So we call them ectoparasites. You know, they usually drink, mostly it's blood, warm, they, they tap onto warm-blooded animals, mostly warm-blooded animals. Uh, in certain cases, I have seen uh, reptilian parasites, uh, reptilian leeches. So, you know, like most of the leeches that you might see around northern part of the country are actually uh, parasites of turtles. Right, and then they are very unlikely to latch on to you. Right, extremely unlikely. I mean, you can even try to, you know, make them. They don't like you. That they're too hot for you, quite literally. Um, and question for you guys: Do you think all leeches are parasitic? They're not. There are non-parasitic free-living leeches, right? Few of them, very few in number, but not all leeches are parasitic, right? 
and you can see the on the uh, the diagram you can see their reproductive system as well as their digestive system so they have a complete digestive system so again they are ectoparasite you might ask oh wait 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 so they are some of them are parasites right most of them are parasitic they drink blood well then if they drink blood why do you why do they need a complete parasitic system the reason is this right um these guys although they are you know um blood drinkers right they actually also ingest cellular parts right they they ingest part of your skin when they actually tap onto you right they do take up harder parts right unlike the previous phylum right who only takes up the fluidic part because of that they actually require a digestive system a complete digestive system the reason why they like require complete digestive system is actually this is i don't know whether it is cool fact or a gross fact um when they they cannot stop drinking blood like when they start tapping onto you so they first become full and they become plump and then after for a few extra minutes they will keep actually pooping out extra blood right so um so so that's another reason why they require a complete system right and then after that they actually stop you know drinking they drop off from you um and then the last group Oh, the class of annelids are polychaetes. Um, these guys actually have a distinct head. Look at my diagrams over here, right? That is called a bobbit worm, right? Its name is bobbit worm. It has a very distinct, very clear head with very specific structures that helps them in sensation as well as uh, acquiring food. They do have parapodia. Can you see in these diagrams, right? They have these things coming off of their side of the body, right? Um, things coming out of their side of their bodies right these parts these parts those are parapodia look at this christmas tree worm over here right all of those very elaborate structures that looks like branches are parapodia right so these guys polychaetes have very extravagant forms of parapodia right and some of these worms actually live inside tubes like you see in over here right so they do have this very extravagant external protrusions from their body called parapodia they could be very small but they are macroscopic you can see them clearly from your naked eye some of them are very elaborate and they actually have structures called antennae right these things you see on the top of their head those are antennae they have sensitive functions they are sensitive to touch they are sensitive to chemicals um and in fact these bobbit worms they actually spend most of their time buried underneath the sea bottom in the sea substrates ocean floor and whenever those antennae are triggered by a moving fish they shoot themselves upward and capture the fish with these structures these are actually very powerful jaws right and what they do is when they capture the fish they go back into the sediment right and, and literally suffocate the fish and then eat it up um sexes are separate right they have male worms they have female worms right and um so meaning like some of them have a male reproductive systems and some of them have fe have female reproductive systems extremely diverse group in terms of body forms right and i have a video link over here, uh, on the bottom now these video links are actually optional they are more helpful for you to learn these things right and i will show you the required video links uh, down the road um i'm not going to go too much detail into the mollusks i'm covering them really quickly um so we are looking at five groups bivalves you know things that you eat right um like clams oysters mussels scallops uh, those have two shells right gastropods mostly garden snails slugs right um cephalopods very interesting group of mollusks um now um for the gastropods like you know the, the gastropoda term means stomach food because their actually stomach lies on their food right um and and when you digest you actually have to, have to cut through the food to get to the stomach that's why they are called also stomach food um and then um cephalopods right we call them head food cephalo head poda food right again gastro stomach poda food uh food and then uh, cephalopods the examples are octopus squids cuttlefish nautilus 
those large creatures, right? All of those are large uh, marine, 100% marine creatures, right? Bivalves are freshwater and marine, both. Um, gastropods are terrestrial and aquatic, right? And then um, scapophoda, that actually includes elephant tusks. Elephant tusks or elephant or tusk shells are these guys, right? Um, or elephant tooth is another name we use for them, right? Um, they are also uh, aquatic. And then um, polyplacophora, um, these guys, right? The example is chitons. So they are all, these are intertidal marine organisms, right? What they actually have is poly means multiple, placophora meaning plates. They have multiple plates, you know, their shell is divided into multiple plates, right? So all mollusks have shells in different forms, right? If you're looking at bivalves, they have two halves of their shell. If you look at gastropods, they have one single shell, right? That actually could coil up, right? Um, and then um, these tusk shells have like a shell that looks like an elephant tusk, right? Um, in cephalopods, right? The shell have been extremely reduced in everything except Nautilus. Nautilus has a complete spiral shaped shell, but everything else like squids, cuttlefish, octopus, they are either absent or reduced to a tiny flimsy part in their body, right? Characteristics for them. Their circulatory system is open. Now, annelids had a closed circulatory system. Mollusks have an open circulatory system except cephalopods. It's really interesting that cephalopods that includes cuttlefish, octopus, squids, they, their system, their body organization is very similar to us, to vertebrates, right? Um, so they have a closed circulatory system, but everything else has an open circulation system. They have clearly three body regions. Now, this is extremely important to know. Mantle, which secretes the shell, which is actually kind of a membranous structure that surrounds the entire body that secretes the shell. So mantle is internal to the shell, but external to the rest of the body. Um, foot on the bottom used for locomotion. Like, I mean, this is actually a diagrammatic feature that explains the shell. And you can see the mantle is the red line, shell is the black line. Thin red line is the mantle, which surrounds the rest of the body. And the foot is on the bottom, right? That is used for largely for locomotion, right? Um, and then the visceral mass in between, right? Which contains all the internal body organs. Right. They do have a coelom, but that coelom could be reduced in size and in terms of the functions it does. And because it has a shell, it has most of the mollusks have a hard exoskeleton. Um, now, these are the different groups I just talked to you about. Now I'm you know, showing you with some more vivid examples. Um, I'm not going into that many detail over here, right? So any questions regarding the very basic intro? Very good. Let's jump on to um, this one. Now this one, I'm not going to spend way too much time because I'm. this is actually explaining what the lab activity is. Some of them I will sp ex uh, spend some time ex you know, talking with you, discussing with you, but uh, other ones I'm going to actually quickly go over. Right, and always, you know, uh, stop and ask questions. Right, so, um, so this is where what you are when you are doing it yourself. You actually have to have your lab manual with you, right, or either online or as a physical copy, and then keep going um, with my PowerPoint um, and with the lab manual on the side. So, first part, as usual, is going through the dichotomous key. Now we know how to run a dichotomous key, but um, just to make sure you understand how this happens, let's let's try to um, take a couple of them and, and and try to key them. Okay? Or are you are you do you want me to uh, key a couple of examples, or are you very comfortable with doing it your own? Give me a shout. A couple examples. Okay. Okay, Kayla, you were going to say something? Okay, all right, very cool, right. Um, um, Emily said a couple of examples and I will do a couple of examples. Um, 
So this one, animal one, says a hard shell, right? Okay, keep that in your mind and look at the look at its features. It it has a spiraling shell, right? It spirals towards a particular direction, right? Um, and let's go back to the key and try to figure out where it belongs. The first one, read with me. Animal with a hard shell, hard outer shell. Second option is animal soft bodied. Where 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 are we going with that, guys? Hard shell. Very good. So one a hard shell, right? So we go to two, right? Guys, uh, do do uh, communicate with me, right? I always have only like you know few people talking to me. Um, two a, right? Says um, animal with a single spiral shaped shell. B animal with two hinged shells. What do you guys think? A. It is clearly a animal with a single spiral shaped shell, right? So that is Sephia, right? This guy is Sephia. Let's do the second example and then I will uh, move on. So we tell we are telling you it's soft bodied. It's not flat, right? It's, so it's it's not dorsoventrally compressed or flattened. It's rather round-ish, but uh, has a softer body, right? Now, and also you can see looking at the animal, it has stuff coming out of its body, right? Um. Again, going from the beginning, right? Animal with a hard shell, animal with a soft body. What do you think? The soft body. Correct, it's a soft body. So we are going to number three. Animal dorsoventrally flattened, animal not dorsoventrally flattened. What do you think? Not dorsoventrally flattened. Obviously, right? Not dorsoventrally flattened. Now you go to six. Animals composed of, um, Animals composed of many serial segments, animals not ap uh, appearing segmented. Let's look at that. What do you think? Do you th see segments or you not? Yeah, because it has like the things on the end. Yeah, many of you are say, uh, seem to say that they do have. Yeah, and you are right. So you go to seven, right? Animals with parapodia at each segment, cephalization prominent. Uh, animals without parapodia, having a clitellum. Well, let's look at this guy. Mm, what, what are parapodia? Look at these things coming out of its side of the body, right? So, well, something is coming out of their body, right? And do they have a clear head, right? Mm, well, this is a much more broader, larger, and there are lots of structures coming out of it, right? And this one is a smaller back end. Right, so not, not, nothing is prominent coming out of here. Clearly you see two different ends. So they have a head and have parapodia. So I'm going to call it for the seven, option A. Nereis is actually what we are looking at. So this is how you key it out. Any questions regarding the two things I did? Okie dokie, let's move on. Okay, so you do it yourself. Um. And these are actually the scientific name and the common name, right, um, of the organisms that you're going to key. I'm providing them to you because remember in your lab notebook, we ask you to maintain a species list. So you need this information for the species list, right? There are other things you have to look up for the species list, but I thought that giving you the complete uh, scientific name and the English name is a good start. All righty. Um, now, remember, again, with respect to your lab notebook, for the flatworm and for the earthworm that you are going to study, and for the clam, for these three organisms, you are going to, um, I have someone sending a chat. Ah, very sorry, Jasmine. Um, let's see, like, I mean, the good news is, you know, I know that happens, that's why we record it. And I, I need to shout out, um, I guess, Kenny, who actually pointed out I wasn't recording earlier. Um, so, platforms and earthworms and clams, for so these three groups, right? Um, yeah, so so if, if you lost connection, don't panic, take your time, come back in, right? Uh, and ask questions for anything that you missed, you know, like internet mishaps is unavoidable. So, for these three animals, you are going to 
um, in your lab notebook, you are going to put A through G, right? What food, what movements, what foods they ingest, uh, the movements they make, what kind of skeleton, body shape, body structure they have, reproduction and development, respiration, circulation, organ systems, uh, and, and the phylum level characteristics, right? You will write those down. Now, I have given some of those to you already in my intro lecture, and whatever I am completing in this part will also give you some um, support, some help, right? What specifically I am looking into for food, I am listing it here, right? What structures and processors they involve for food capturing, ingestion, digestion, absorption, and elimination, right? It could be simple as um, they have a complete digestive system. They have a mouth and an anus, right? And they have other organs, you know, for the purpose of digestion or passage of food, right? And they are predators or they are scavengers. They are parasite, ectoparasite, endoparasite. So that's what I expect. And again, these are redundant with like, you know, some of the homework assignments. And that's what is exactly we hope uh, that you master by the time of your practical. So um, it helps a lot to complete this as we go. Now, um, second exercise is actually in your lab manual is um, to watch these videos on your own um, with respect to uh, flatworm behavior, right? And the flatworm is actually a planaria, the dugesia that, um, that we are going to show you. Like it will show how it moves and of course shows how it feeds, right? And also it will point to a specific uh, external structures that I expect you guys to know. Now, the specific structures we do need to know, we, ex we want you to know is actually over here on the bottom. Oh, let me take my pointer, it's over here. That's actually the structures we need you to know, right? Um, so it's actually touch sensitive. When you touch it, it actually retracts from um, whatever the pin you are trying to like poke at. If you turn on light, it will move away from the light, right? And um, so these are the terms that, uh, that I expect you to know in terms of the planarian anatomy, external and internal anatomy, right? Um, and here's labeling, right? So the middle thing is actually the pharynx, right? And the pharynx opens or protrudes outside through the mouth. And then the pharynx opens to the gastrovascular cavity, right? And, you know, gastrovascular cavity has three branches, right? One going forward, two going backward. How do you know what is the forward direction? Eye spots, right? Those two tiny dots that you can see in the video or in the live animals, right? Are actually the eye spots, but which are sensitive to light. They will not create an image but they will be sensitive to light. It will help the animal to go away from the light and move towards darker areas. Um, and then not that clear in this particular uh, preserved specimen, but extremely clear in your video and in this photograph are these two horn-like structures that is coming out of its uh, body. Those are called auricle. Those are also like an antennae. They are sensitive to touch and also they are sensitive to different chemicals. So they help animal to feel and taste. If you take a cross section, cross section looks like this, right? Um, so you have, um, so they actually have muscular systems, right? They have circular muscles around it, uh, around them. And then I wanted to move this slightly somewhere else, like over here. Yeah. And then they have an epidermis on the bottom, right? And then actually they have different types of muscles throughout their body, right? And then since they have multiple branches of the dig digestive system in a cross section, you will see uh, different branches, right? Like as different tubes, right? As digestive system components. Um, and here, this is actually kind of a thing that I, um, that we created, particularly highlighting parts that or the ways we will test you in the exam, right? So here, um, I, I, this also helps you to study for the practical, right? So rather than just pointing towards here, I am asking you, right, extensible organ for obtaining food. If you remember what I explained, can someone tell me what this particular organ is? The pharynx. Very good, excellent. Organs over here, sensitive to light. I spots. Very good, excellent. These chemosensory organs that are sense that, that can help them to taste. Article. I can't or, or, 
Oracle. I think you are, I know what you are saying, but yeah, just pronunciation, Oracle, right, good. So just like that, you know, follow the rest of the thing and label them yourself. Um, and then you get into the earthworm dissection, right? Um, and you watch the earthworm dissection, right? And then we mention, you know, what parts, you know, what kind of things that you want to do, right? The most important thing from a dissection or from an observation is making the drawing, labeling them, right? Take as, again, remember my mantra. I don't care how ugly your drawing is but I care how well you label it, how completely you label it and how detailed you are, right? Um, now, these are the anatomical features we expect you to know in the earthworm dissection, right? And these are the, um, and then of course there are external features you need to know and then there are internal features I expect you to know. First, let's go through the external features, right? Um, so I'm showing you multiple diagrams over here just to you know help you guys understand. Um, so I told you how to know the front end and the back end, right? Whatever the end that is closer to the clitellum, this ring-like structure is the mouth. The other end is the anus. So I kind of created this fake Sirai, like, I mean, you might be wondering like, how does the Sirai actually look like? This, the, the CT actually look like, the CT actually looks like this, right? So these are the actual segments. So from each segment on either side, you might get a single or a multiple, a couple of uh, two pairs of CT coming out, right? For earthworms, it's actually a single pair, right? But for other analytes, there could be multi, you know, like two pairs, right? But, um, so there's a segment and this tiny hair, coming out of that, uh, the side of the body. The purpose of the CT is to help locomotion, right? They kind of hold on to the substrate as they crawl, right? Um, and then the other structures we want you to know, um, like if you look at the front end of the earthworm, it looks like this or rather look like this. This is actually much better because it's more realistic. The first dome-like thing that is protruding straight up that particular section is called protostomium, right? And then the, and then actually the mouth is kind of behind the protostomium, right? So the protostomium comes out through the mouth and the actual body segment is actually found after, it's called peristomium, right? So this particular ring-like segment and all the segments lo should look like a ring outside, right? This is the first actual segment, which is called peristomium, right? And then of course you, you under, there are multiple segments, right? And the other things you need to notice is actually um, the lip-like structures that you find, right? Are actually the male genital pore or, or male gonopore is another term that you can use, right? Um, the male gonopores appear like this, you know, like lips, like the, in the dissection, you will see what I mean. Now, female gonopores are found in the immediately above, immediately preceding segment, right? You find female gonopores. Female gonopores are extremely small, right? You may not be able to label them, right? So what? So what? I, in in the practical, if I were to ask, if I show, were to show you a diagram like this, right, with clearly this male gonopores, and then point towards this particular segment right in front of it, and ask, what kind of structures or holes do you observe in that specimen? The answer should be female gonopores. And I can also ask, what is their function? Well, connecting with um, male reproductive system or receiving sperms or you know, something like that should be the answer. <sighs> All right. And again, position, the, the exact position, like I think it's 14th and 15th segments in this particular species of earthworms that you are studying the common earthworm, right? But if you, there are so many other species of earthworms, right? Where exactly you find clitellum, where exactly you find male versus female gonopores, that can vary uh, among different species. But for the species you are dissecting, it is always on the 14th and 15th segments that you find gonopores. Um, so body planes, right? Now let's look at, uh, talk with me. Um, now this, what, what is this particular thing, guys? Clitellum. Very good. Yeah, clitellum, clitellum, uh, tomato, tomato, right? 
I, I, when I was in college, I was educated in under the British system, so I pronounce things in their way, right? Um, so, what should be this particular plane? What is it? What end is that? Is it anterior or posterior? It is anterior. closer. Anterior, very good. It's closer to the clitellum. So, in that case, this plane is what? Posterior. Posterior, very good, right? And um, the back of the body, meaning like if you are looking at a live earthworm crawling on the ground and you are like kind of bending over and looking at it on the from the top side, what you are looking at what plane? Ventral or dorsal? Dorsal. Very good, dorsal. And the poor worm is crawling on its belly-ish, right? So that belly-ish underside is what? Ventral. Ventral, correct, right? Um, yeah, that's... The answer. So again, let's uh, do some labeling, few of those label, uh, labelings, right? So the flap of the skin that kind of protrudes from the anterior end that comes through the mouth, what is that? Starts with a P. Okay. Yes, I know, I, <laughs> right? Starts with a P, right? But uh, the, the, there are, so. Prostomium. Very good. Protostomium. Pro. First, right? Early. Pro. So, protostomium, right? That's how you remember. Um, the one, the actual first segment that is that, that, that you find after the protostomium is what? Peristomium. Very good. Peristomium. Peri means surrounding. Surrounding the mouth. Surrounding the, pros, uh, 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 the, the first part. So, peristomium. Yeah, I get it. It's it's tongue twisting, right? Um, hey, the good news, this is open book exam, right? So um, knowing is something, being able to uh, pronounce is another. Being able to correctly spell, is imp spell, spell that is important, but I would be the last one to worry about your pronunciation, right? Um, and individual each Section is termed what? I'm like, you know, like these segments. What do we call those uh, segments? There's a name for that. Can someone tell me the name of that? Starts with an M. I did not mention that word earlier. If you read the uh, manual, you might know. It's called metamere. Right, mere means segments. Metamere means actually the um, individual segments of the body. Right. So, here's a question for you: the f is peristomium a segment or not? Yes. Correct. Is protostomium a segment or not? No. Correct. Protostomium is not a segment. The reason is. It does not have the body cavity, the coelomic component. That's why, right? That's another reason. Like if you won't look at through segmentation, right? You should be looking at an animal with a body cavity, right? That's another reason why we do not consider those proglottids of tapeworms as um, body segments. All right. Now, in this animal, this lip-like uh, large openings that is used to release sperms, are uh, what? Um, the male, um, I can't pronounce the word, it starts with a G, ends with poor. <laughs> male going to poor? If, you don't, if, if it is a harder term, I, I accept English, right? I mean, that's our language, okay? Male genital openings, male genital pores. Completely fine with that, okay? A, a, a scientifically accurate too. I'm not like, you know, giving you, um, you know, uh, uh, um, some apologetic credits. No, that, that's scientifically completely acceptable, right? All right. And then this is the cross-section of an earthworm, right? So um, this is actually how it exactly looks like in a specimen. This is the same thing as a more prettier diagram, right? So uh, I want you to understand what a cross-section is. This is the entire animal. If you cut across the body, right? Where you end up with like circular ends, you are looking at the cross section, right? If you cross cut along the length of the body of the worm, you are looking at a longitudinal section, right? We don't look at longitudinal sections, 
we look at mostly cross sections, right? So understand what a cross section is, right? So I have over here, I'm providing different um, structures, right? Um, that I want you to know. The very big thing you find over here is actually the digestive cavity, digestive system. Lumen means hole, right? The interior of a tube is the lumen, right? So this is the lumen of the intestine. Intestine is part of the digestive tract. Um, and tiflosol is actually that found on the top of the top part of the uh, digestive wall folds in to the lumen, right? And that's what tiflosol is. What? Why do? You, what kind of a purpose do you think it serves? Any guesses? It's actually a very simple thing. So. Because of the tiflosol, it's a folding. It folds into the digestive system. So because of that folding, the actual surface area of the digestive system of the intestine increases. Because of that, absorption increases, right? It increases the efficiency of digestion and absorption. That's why they have the tiflosol, right? Um, and again, this huge uh, red, chunk is actually a blood vessel it's the so the larger blood vessel you see on the on the top of tiflosol is the dorsal blood vessel now it's important to understand what is dorsal what is ventral right so where so this tiflosol is towards the dorsal part right this huge large blood vessel which is actually you know like it appears darker in the slide is the dorsal surface right so that's actually the, this is the dorsal plane right of the animal right let me actually drag this further down Okay, this is the dorsal part. And now you know this is the ventral part, okay? Um, and knowing the, that distinction is extremely important as well. Now, and this is the body wall, right? Body wall has the epidermis surrounding it. And inside of the epidermis, you see two types of muscles, right? Longitudinal muscles that extend the length of the body, right? And circular muscles, right? That are actually kind of occurs on the opposite, uh, 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 that is, that occurs perpendicular to the longitudinal muscle, right? So circular shaped, ones that make circles around the body and one that goes on the length of the body. Length of the body, longitudinal, circles around the body, circular, right? Now again, why is it important to have those two muscle arrangements? It's not two types of muscles, it's two different muscle arrangements. Why is it important? We actually mentioned this briefly in the previous lecture. Remember how those poor nematodes move? Remember nematodes had muscles and only one type of muscle, one type of muscle arrangement, and they were just twitching, right? They were not like, you know, showing more directional, more efficient movements. These guys can move very efficiently. You have seen them moving. That's because they actually have these two muscle arrangements. No, I'm not against if you call them two types of muscles, but to be more accurate, I would rather call it two muscle arrangements, right? I'm not going to take points off if you say two types of muscles. No, just want to be clear on that. The space between the body wall and the digestive system is the coelom. Okay. Mm. Moving on. So this is actually what it looks like. If you know, like in the in the lab manual, it asks you to cut a, a earthworm and take a tiny segment and look it under the dissecting microscope. We did it for you, and this is what it looks like. Now let's try to understand um, some of these. Um, items, right? Okay, one more thing I want to mention over here, right? So this is the top large blood vessel is a dorsal blood vessel, it appears darker in coloration. On the opposite side, you see this smaller vessels, right? Those are actually um, ventral, ventrally located. Those are actually uh, ventral blood vessels or smaller blood vessels. And this particular solid structure you see is actually the nerve cord. So the nerve cord is ventral and it's much smaller in size compared to the dorsal blood vessel. Okay. Now, remembering that, let's label it together, guys. Um, so this should be the digestive system, right? And there is a huge fold, a pouch that is pouching into the digestive system. What should that be? 
this thing? Lumen. Mm, lumen is the hole, right? So the tube, the interior space that is filled with gunk is the lumen, okay? The thing that folds into the lumen is what? Starts with a T. Uh-huh, Tiflosol, right? The folding, right? Tiflosol. Um, so, and, and our, here, if I just point towards this interior with the gunk, which is actually soil, right? Earthworms eat soil and decaying organic matter. It would be right to call that the lumen, like Randolph said, right? But now I'm asking, not the cavity, I'm asking tube for digestion. What specific tube do you see for the entire length of the animal? Intestine. Very good, intestine, right? Um, and the organs that actually have circular and longitudinal arrangements, those are what? Muscle. Correct. Absolutely correct, right? And this thick, dark colored thing on the top of the tiflosol, right? It's a tube-like thing that helps to move blood on the length of the body. That should be? Dorsal blood vessel. Very good. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned not just blood vessel, you mentioned dorsal blood vessel. So be precise in your answer, right? Now, right across the opposite, right? There are two tubes, one tiny tube that moves blood along the length of the worm, and that should be? Ventral blood vessel. Very good, ventral blood vessel. And this much larger, thicker but light colored solid structure should be? And the nerves. That is the, be precise, right? That's a nerve, yeah, part of the nervous system to be precise, that is the nerve cord, right? Mm -hmm. And it is ventrally located, okay? You don't have to say ventral nerve cord because they only have one nerve cord. Now, internal structures. This is a little bit complicated, but it's easy to understand when you try to link where they are found with respect to what system and what they do, right? Um, so, we start with the protostomium, right? Which is actually an external structure. And then uh, it opens up to the pharynx, right? And then the pharynx, which is actually a very muscular structure you see over here, right? And what you cannot see that actually sort of is hidden in this part is, want to guess what? What, what comes immediately after the pharynx? Even in us. Esophagus. Esophagus, very good, right? And then, um, Right, what, why you cannot see the esophagus is actually it's quite short. And the other reason is actually you see hearts, multiple hearts. You can also call these hearts aortic arches, right? And there are actually about five of them. Um, and then uh, in terms of the other organs, you actually see uh, this calciferous glands. I do not recall whether I mentioned that as a required part. If it is not a required part, don't bother about knowing what that is. Um, and then, of course, this whitish bulb-like structures you see on either side of the body in multiples, multiples are actually seminal vesicles. Do you remember what seminal vesicles do? They retain the sperm. Great. I would rather say store. I, I know what, that's what you meant when you say retain, storing sperms, right? And then seminal receptacle, what do you think those do? Receptacle, receives sperms, right? So that's why I was telling Randolph earlier, better to say um, store because sto sperm storage is happening in somewhere and then receiving and retaining could happen elsewhere as well. So seminal receptacles receive those sperms um, that is received from another male right, from another individual, from another male reproductive system, right? Seminal vesicles stores and keeps sp uh, sperms and e ejects them into another worm when they are copulating, right? Copulating is when they are coming together, attaching themselves together, right? Um, and then the esophagus connects to a, you know, like two stomach-like organs, right? First part is called crop. The bottom part is called gizzard, right? Now, Crop is flimsy. They are thin walled, smaller. Gizzard is much larger, thick walled. Crop is retaining the food temporary. Gizzard, what do you think gizzard does? I mean, you guys know bird gizzard, right? What do you think it does? Grinds, breaks up the food. Yeah, think about what earthworms eat. They earth literally dirt, 
right? So you need to grind that dirt, right? So that's why that's actually why they have a very thick walled gizzard. And then that passed into the intestine, right? Um, and then, um, and here the Tiflaso labeling is sort of misleading. I'm not very uh, happy about that kind of label coming up. Don't worry about that. We will not ask you to point Tiflaso in a dissection, right? And then what is the beauty of this? Again, you know, this is very unlikely to observe in a real dissection is a dorsal blood vessel, right? Um, because we are opening it from the uh, dorsal, from, from its top. Right, okay. And then I have added a couple of other photographs with labels, just so that you can actually see different views um, of the same animal. So let's label this together with me, right? Um, so the tube for moving blood along the entire length of the, uh, the worm. Now here we are saying back of the worm, meaning on the dorsal side, which is what? Dorsal blood vessel. Very good. Um, let's pick something else. Organs for storing sperm before sending it to another individual. That would be? Seminal vesicles. Very good. Seminal vesicles. And organs for pumping blood. That's interesting. Which one is that? And it says organs. So be careful when you answer. Hearts. Yeah. So hearts, right? Hearts. They have multiple. You can also say aortic arches. I prefer the term aortic arches. Again, I accept both answers as correct. I personally prefer aortic arches because I don't know whether they qualify the true definition of a heart, but that's my academic opinion. Um, not to bother you with that. All right. Um, the pouch in the digestive system for holding food, right? Not the thick walled one, the thin walled one. Crop. Very good, crop. Um, the muscular organ that helps move food from mouth to elsewhere in the front end, which is what? Pharynx. Very good, very good, pharynx, excellent. Um, I, I'm not going for every point. Like I'm just picking a couple of things that's helped. And then what? Then the next part is actually the clam dissection. I put two videos for that. Not to, I, I don't require you to follow both videos. The first one is the one I require you to follow. The second link is an additional one that I provided um, just to, um, just so that you can actually get another angle, another wave of these things. So the first one is actually, they will show you different clams dissected to show different organ systems. The second link will actually, will be similar to what we would have done, right? Dissecting one clam and keep showing every organ in that particular clam. Um, that's kind of why I have two links over there, right? Um, now, this is the anatomy terms that I want you guys to know, right? And now let's look at some of those external anatomical features, right? Um, so if you are looking at a clam, right, the pointy part, right, over top over here, right, is actually called umbo. The umbo is actually the first shell, right? When these guys, you know, transform from a larvae to an adult, when you have the tiny, teeny, weeny clam, adult clam, right, that has a single shell, uh, two halves of shells around it, right? Now, that two, that, that umbo is actually that particular first shell. So that's actually an interesting thing. How on earth does the rest of the shell develops? Remember I mentioned mollusks you has three organs or three parts of their body, not three organs, three parts of their body. And one of them secretes the shell, which is what? Remember there are three parts, foot, visceral mass, mantle, which one actually secretes the shell? Mantle. Correct. It is a mantle, right? So mantle keeps, as the animal grows, 
right? To accommodate a larger body, mantle keeps secreting additional shell layers, right? So every shell appears underneath the first one, the next one underneath the second one, the next one underneath the third one, like that. As the animal grows, you know, most likely in every season, in every year, the animal grows a new shell underneath the older one, right? So that's why you see these ring patterns, right? When you're looking at any bivalve, right? In some bivalves, it's much more clear. In certain bivalves, it's less clear, right? Um, and then da, 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 da. the right on the side of the umbo is actually the hinge, like a dough hinge that hinges the two halves together, keep those together. And in order to help, keep hinges together. There are additional structures over here called hinge teeth, right? Um, and then on this side, right? On the opposite side, you get additional teeth called lateral teeth, right? Those are just to like, you know, they interlock so that the shell does not slip, like they properly lock. That's the purpose of these th things. Um, if you open the animal up, you actually see on the side of the shell two very big literal scars, right? Those are actually not wound healing scars. They look like that. But the purpose of the scars are to provide a surface for the attachment of muscles that is responsible for opening and closing the shells. Do, 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 do. And then if you open up the clam, you actually see these particular structures. Uh, I will actually have better diagrams over here, right? To show those uh, particular parts. Um, another cool part that I want you to know is how, you know, like in a lab, you see the clam like this, right? Resting on one of its shells. But in the nature, it's more like this, right? They keep their like the unhinged side to the environment, right? It's, it's open side is actually kind of exposed, right? And um, so, so in nature, um, right? They actually kind of burrow, right? Uh, onto the substrate and keep the, the unhinged side open to the water, right? And then they keep sucking water uh, into their shells for the purpose of respiration and for the purpose of um, filter feeding to acquire food. Um, and also what comes out, right, which you don't see in these images, unfortunately, um, is actually the two siphons, in-current and ex-current ex siphon that actually sucks water in and out, right, for the purpose of filter feeding and also to ventilate gases. Now, um, what do you think these things are? Like the, the stuff that, this flimsy stuff that actually kind of is um, coming out of the shell, very like thin hair-like structures. Like feelers? Yeah, those are actually gills. Right, so sometimes the gills can be protruded out of the shell, right? And sometimes the gills are not flimsy like that. They are very like clearly um, visible, right? Like, you know, much larger in terms of their sizes, okay? But for your dissection, when you dissect it, you are dissecting a dead animal, right? Um, so since you're dissecting a dead animal, um, all the structures are inside, like retracted inside, okay? Um, so, again, let's look at the planes. The umbo side, where you have the hinge, right? What plane is that? It's kind of the back of the animal. Posterior. Um, dorsal, right? Back is always dorsal, right? So if that is a back is dorsal, the underneath, right, is ventral, right? So it's kind of interesting. The animal actually sort of drills into the substrate from its back side, right? From its dorsal side. And the ventral side keeps up open, right? Um, the unhinged side is actually ventral, right? Um, and the front plane where the ombo point towards, right? Is actually the anterior. And now the opposite side is posterior. Right. Um, and the internal anatomy, again, you know, like this one, I will go a little, 
little bit into some details, right? Not whole lot. I did explain these particular scars earlier, right? This is the this is an actual photograph. You can see the scarring pattern for the posterior and the anterior adductor muscle, right? Um, and then these are actually the hinge teeth. Now, those teeth don't actually look like teeth. If you feel with your thumb along these teeth, you feel that like a serration, like, like a saw tooth, right? Um, those are much larger teeth, so we call them a hinge teeth, or we can uh, also call them cardinal teeth. I don't know why they use that term. Hinge teeth is more than okay with me. In certain cases, you do see that teeth on this side, right? I mean, if you look closely, like, you know, you can see some serration on this particular photograph, right? Those are called lateral teeth. Right. Um, the purpose of that is to like shut the muscle firmly when the sh shelves are together. Right. Um, other internal structures. First, look at this. This particular organ, right, that actually has sort of a you know like um, fringeness to it, are actually gills. Right. Gills has two functions, and one of them you already know, which is what. Gas exchange. Respiration, gas exchange. Anyone want to guess the second function of the gills? Catch food. Sorry? Catch food. Ah, 100% correct. Feeding. They filter food. Whatever the things comes in through the siphons are filtered by gills, right? So, so um, remember, filter feeding or foraging or catching food, all of those are fine, correct answers, right? Um, and then, of course, you see this large, um, extremely large muscle, right, with a huge attachment surface, that is the posterior adductor muscle. Right across that, on the other end, smaller muscle, anterior adductor muscle, right? Um, and then this particular fleshy structure that does not have the fringeness to that is the foot. Now, what do you think they use the foot for, guys? This is a muscle, right? Movement? Yeah, I mean, you can argue that. Yeah, do actually bivalves move with that foot? Mm, yeah, I would not say no. But what do you think the most important function of the foot? How do they like, remember the images I showed you earlier? They actually anchor onto the substrate. So the foot is like a wedge. Like, you are going to say, wait, Prof, do you even know what a wedge looks like? That doesn't look like a wedge, no. In a live animal, like if you look at a live animal, the foot looks like a wedge. So they actually literally wedge themselves onto the substrate and anchor themselves onto the substrate with the foot, right? So the primary for purpose of the foot is actually anchoring, attaching or oh, oh, um, um, burrowing, burrowing onto the substrate, right? Um, now, I, I'm not, but that's a primary function. Locomotion is not wrong. Can someone else want to make a guess and tell me what other ways do muscles move, particularly scallops? Can anyone make a guess? It's really funny, actually. Don't they use like the, their two shells? Like, open? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they flap their shells like that and move. Um, not even kidding. So, and then what other organs do we see, right? So, uh, gills, another name is tin, uh, tindia, like enough names are there, gills are just fine, right? And they actually have a one single heart. Fun fact, heart surrounds the intestine, right? There's a tube that goes through the heart. That's actually the intestine, right? Um, and then, of course, you see the large muscle, right? And then, of course, the siphons. Now, I label incurrent and excurrent siphon, but in reality, you cannot tell what is incurrent, what is excurrent. What all you see is two tubes, right? And and sometimes those tubes are even hard to pull your pull out, right? Um, and um, in current, it takes in water, X current spools out the water, right? Like throughout the water. But for you, if I point towards any tube, right? If I say, what is this tube like organ that is located right around the posterior abductor muscle? I want you to label both in current and X current siphons. Don't try to worry about, oh, is this X current, is this in current? No, you cannot do that. 
Um, and also this, this thing and that thing over here, right? Those are actually called labial palps. Their purpose, labial is like lips, right? What they do is they actually push food towards the mouth, right? So food is first filtered by the gills, trapped by the gills, and those things actually move around here and there and sort of um, shovel the food towards the mouth, right? So I'm explaining the function because it's easy to know the organ when you know the function. Mm. Again, you know, like I, we just label them. We'll go through a couple of labeling. This, um, so this particular thing, right? Um, like if you, let me actually show something over here. Um, uh, 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 right, this one, okay. Um, so this front end, muscle, right? The shape, the size is hard to compare because this you're looking at sort of the, uh, like a half of the side. So the, the front end of the muscle, the anterior end of the muscle, right? And you're looking at this huge um, muscle of the bivalve, right? So what should this be? What muscle is this? Um, either the abductor muscle or the foot. It is the abductor muscle. So how do you know the difference? This has a attachment surface, right? The very clear, like broad, roundish attachment surface. So then you know it is actually the anterior abductor muscle, right? There's a retractor muscle. I'm not showing that. So that's why I'm saying abductor, right? Because you need to open one and you need another to close one. That's why. Um, and then, so this one is going to be the posterior. Now, this versus that, right? Now this is like a single part, right? And this actually has kind of a dual part and has a lot of serration on it. This is towards the ventral end of the muscle. This is more interior. So what is this? Gills. That's correct, those are gills. And then that? The foot. Correct, that is the foot, right? Um, the huge pouch that actually stores all the organ is, remember the three parts of the molar's body, Annie? Um, is it like the mantle, one of them? Is that the thing you're talking about? Not the mantle. So this is the one that actually contains all the body organs, which is? Visceral mass. Correct, visceral mass, right? And then, so, um, this particular fringy structure, right? That is responsible for producing the man, producing the shell is? Mandible. Man ah, mandible or oh, ma mantle. Okay, mantle. Um, and the cavity that surrounds the mantle is called mantle cavity, right? Um, well, that's actually good enough. Um, and then when you dissect the animal, right, we, um, you have to actually cut through uh, the mandrel and I kind of cut through the, the visceral mass to see whatever inside of it, right? So um, the fun part is externally without cutting through, you cannot see the separation between the, the, uh, the gonads and the stomach, right? So the part where you have actually more gray, dark colored particulated material, right? Um, and has sort of a sandy look is actually the stomach part, right? This area. And the bottom of that part, like, you know, where you actually have a lot more gray, uh, not gray, like light colored, yellow, brown colored part that looks like oatmeal is actually the gonads, right? Um, and then I did mention about the heart. And another fun fact is actually, this is not, not very clear in this diagram, but very, very clear in your video is actually the holes of the heart. The heart belongs to the open circulatory system. So in that case, there should be some holes in the circulatory system, particularly the heart to pump blood into an open space. So that's why they actually have 
big openings in the heart, right? And then I mentioned the heart, through the heart, a tube goes through, through the heart and that is the intestine. Uh, the rest of the part is actually, I'm not going to uh, explain that much information. Those are um, certain o organs. Uh, starting from this one, these are the actual displays, right? Certain organisms, we provide the scientific name and the English name, and then it follows a particular question, right? So this one, flatworm lacks a silo, but um, so this particular flatworm doesn't have a silo, but Ketopteris and uh, Limax are actually silomic, right? So some basal animals don't have a silo, but more derived animals have a silo, right? So what are the advantages of having a silo? Do you, uh, can I hear from some of you? Think about, uh, how do you think? What the coelom does, right? And, and, and what kind of functions does coelom perform? And can the, we consider this an advantage? Can I get some, mm -hmm. Emily, some answer? Movement. It has a hydrostatic function, so it helps movement. Number one, that's great. Number two? Like it provides a little bit of structure. 100% correct. Maintains body structure, body shape. Very good. Number three. Uh, it would give the animal the ability to have an open circulatory system. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that, but I wouldn't make that is not an not, not at least directly an advantage. So they have a coelomic cavity and then they have a secondary cavity that blood drains into. Right? Hemolymph drains into called hemoseal. So hemoseal and Coelom are two different systems, two different cavities, right? Hemocele is larger, hemo, uh, coelom is much more smaller, right? But here's why you, what you said is really, really important, right? Now, um, the open circulatory system, right? You know, for, for today's example, the example is mo most mollusks, right? So mollusks have two different systems right, um, two different cavities. But there are other open circulatory, circulatory system animals that may not have two different systems, right? So coelom actually helps a gaseous exchange, um, nutrients exchange, right? Um, kind of provides nourishment to the organs. It pro creates a space to retain organs. It creates an, a huge fluid filled opening for other complex organs to evolve, right? So that's actually several other advantages. It actually provides nourishment for the organs, helps material exchange, helps um, evolution of complexity inside the body cavity um, and, and all of those. So, so Gerard's point is not wrong, but it's you have to be careful what organism you're talking about, particularly with respect to open circulatory systems. And then, of course, it follows by several questions. Um, right. So let's tackle this question really quickly. How do flukes guess you, do gaseous exchange? And how on earth does the uh, uh, this polychaete, parchment worm, Ketopteras, do gaseous exchange? Let's go to some examples. Uh, this is a fluke, right? And that is the parchment worm, right? So word about the parchment worm, parchment worm lives inside a tube. It creates a tube, it digs a hole, and then actually, sec actually secretes a tube, U-shaped tube, and lives inside the tube for the rest of their life, right? And draws an air current from, from the sea, and the water goes through like this, right? And, 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 and that water current is important for gaseous exchange and feeding. Now, going back to the question, right? How do you think that um, gaseous exchange happen in flukes? Diffusion. Diffusion through skin, right? Now, when you say diffusion, that's like the mechanism, right? Um, now, how do we exchange gases? That's also diffusion, right? So I, I want to mention like specific, be specific in any question. Um, diffusion through the body covering, right? That would be the perfect answer. And they don't have a system. Parchment firm, this guy, how do you think it performed gaseous exchange? Do they have um, specific respiratory systems? Can they use their 
body covering for that? What do you think? Um, do they have gills or some sort? That's not a, that's actually a good point. That's an excellent point. So some of the parapodia, remember those fleshy limb-like structures that is all over this animal's body on either side? Some of those parapodia, right, have modified into fans to create a water current to create a water current. And some of the parapodia actually has modified into gills that actually external gills to be specific, right? That actually helps gaseous exchange. Now somebody can ask, ask the question, these are still smaller creatures, right? So these parapodia, right, could actually help gaseous exchange. Can someone, can, can somebody will ask the question, okay, but still, uh, can other parts like these fans or these wings help gaseous exchange? They could. Their body covering can still help gaseous exchange, right? Um, and then, so in this animal, I, I mentioned they live in a tube. Can you see in this photograph, right? This entire U-shaped structure is actually the tube they produce. So they secrete a glue outside and they, with that glue, they actually, you know, kind of glue up all the sand particles in the ocean bottom, rock particles, and creates a tube, right? Um, and live in that tube. So they dig, secrete the glue, makes the tube and live in that tube forever, right? And they can move in and out of the tube. Are, are they stuck in the tube? No, they can use this notopodia, another type of a parapodia to move out in and out of the tube. For example, the tube got clogged up. It's old, it's, 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 it's you know, breaking apart. Can they get out of there and make a new tube? Of course they can do if they need to. Can they move? and crawl outside, yeah, that's what the notopodia is for. They can do that. Um, so basically that's actually, um, those are the different um, questions I have, but do actually give me, um, once I finish up today, I, I, I need to go back and check whether I have all the displays. I kind of, I get a feeling that I may not have included all the displays, but I will double check that. Um, yeah, basically these are the ones that, um, these are definitely part of it, but I want to make sure. Um, but I will upload the correct one to the Blackboard just right at the end of the day, I will do that. Um, so these are, there are the, those are the two questions and those uh, are at least are part of the display. Any questions regarding how to do the lab on your own? Oh. Okay, very good. Now let's still, go to- I have one question. Yeah. I'm, still, I'm still not sure that, of the difference between answering the questions for the lab and putting information to the species list. Okay, that's a good, good point. Like, are you asking me like, where should they go to? Just like, just like the difference. Okay, so um, answering the question, there are two types of questions we ask. Okay, remember the lab manual itself has some pre-lab questions that you have to answer right when you read it. And as you do the dissections, the manual also asks certain questions, right? And then um, these displays that is part of the lab exercise also has questions. So those are the different types of questions you have. All of those answers can go into your lab manual um, under like, and there are several sections. Let me look at the lab manual chapter over here really quickly. And so um, if you look at the lab manual um, chapter, right, on notebook, right, on the part it's named notebook three, right, it's kind of the, um, on the second page about the notebooks, um, it says like notes, throughout your notebook, you should have notes from A, instruct introduction part, B, answers to all the questions and queries stated in the lab manual. So that's actually answers your question. So in, when you complete your lab notebook, right, under the notes section for each lab title under the notes, you can answer all of those questions. Display questions, um, questions in the lab notebook as the pre-lab part, questions in the lab notebook that comes as you do the lab, right? All Does of the those- The drawings also go there? That's also correct. The drawings also go there. Right, you start with the drawing and then what happens is, you know, like you complete the drawing and as you go through the lab manual, you answer questions. So you turn a page and answer the question somewhere else, right? You know, like in, in the subsequent page and go, come back to your drawing and keep completing the drawing. And then there's another question. You turn back 
answer that particular question, right? Come back to complete your drawing, right? And labeling. So you're right. Uh, the C part is every sketch draw being expected in your lab manual, right? So yeah. Does that answer your question or do is there something else I need, I can clarify for you? Also, also the, the species list, what exactly do you put there? That's also a good question. And it's actually described if you look at the same page of the lab manual, um, it says species list. All organisms that you work with should be listed, like every organism, right, um, should be included there. Does that include the checklist, uh, the key? Yes. Does that include the animals you digest? Yes. Does that include certain examples I mentioned in the background that does not appear in the lab? If you want to, you could, but I don't expect that, right? Because I, I try to keep a, o, the same animals over and over and over. So any animal that is mentioned in the lab exercise, right? No matter what the ex activity is, that goes to the species list, right? And um, in your study notes, you might include terminology with different definitions and key characteristics of phyla you have studied. So. Um, Oh, no, that's actually practical study guide. I'm sorry. Like for the species list, all organisms that you work with should be listed in this section. This will be checked during the spot check, blah, blah, blah. Include the following information into the species um, list. Common name of the animal, right? Some of them I give you, some of them you have to look up. Scientific names. I almost always give you the scientific name, right? Um, classification. What does that mean? Remember the linear classification? Starting from domain, phylum, uh, a kingdom, phylum, blah, 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 right? Going through uh, classes, order, family, genus, species, right? That classification, right? And some of them we provide, some of them you look up. Um, and notes, any additional notes that I explained in the intro part or that I explain as I go on in the, uh, the lab exercise, anything you learn when you do the lab activity can go into the notes, right? And then anything that you learn on top of all of that can go into optional notes. Optional note is optional, right? It's not something that, that I will provide extra credits if I see that part, but if I don't see that part, that's fine, right? Um, sometimes what students do is, you know, like anything that does not fit in, that they think it's important to know that doesn't fit in anywhere else, they actually uh, include that into the, um, the practical study notes com component. Anything else regarding the lab notebook maintenance? Again, things I described, guys, if you missed anything I mentioned, you are fine. It's in the lab manual, right? In your hard copy or in the uh, electronic PDF I uploaded. Okay, if you have any clarification, keep asking. It's not too late to do any, any of those changes now, right? Uh, any questions before I move on to the homework regarding that? That's a good question to ask. All right, let's move on to the homework. Um, first of all, any questions regarding the Ecdetozoan homework so far? Any question? Okie dokie. I need to quickly clarify a couple of things because uh, I'm clarifying because a student asked that question. So we are quickly going over the ecdidozoan um, lab homework. We did explain quite a bit about, about the um, the crayfish versus Ascaris comparison, right? But I did not go that much into detail about the subsequent parts. I thought they were easier, but um, I, I got some questions. So I wanted to go over that really quickly. Um, work. So the part where we ask you to list um, this, I, I, I went through the part. Um, are you looking at the same PDF homework as I am? Give me a nod. Okay, good. Um, so we went through this particular part and then on over here, compare and contrast characteristics of insects and crustaceans describe at least three similarities um, and three differences. So in this case, right, it's quite 
you know, like uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over a couple of um, examples with you um, on that one, right? Uh, similarities and differences. Um, so for the, what kind of things are more unique to insects? Well, antennae, not just antennae, right? How many antennae, right? Uh, insects have only a single pair, right? But crustaceans have two pairs. That's actually a good thing to mention, right? And then um, insects, you can mention, usually most often have wings and crustaceans are never going to have that character, right? And then um, insects always have three pairs of walking appendages, right? Um, crustaceans, have different types of walking appendages, right? Certain sets for walking uh, and uh, certain sets for swimming. So they have multiple types of uh, external appendages. Um, insects are largely terrestrial or freshwater. Crustaceans are hundred, are la not one hundred percent, largely um, aquatic, right? Marine and freshwater. Um, now, why am I cherry picking my things? Do you think there are any terrestrial crustaceans? What do you think? Have you any heard of some examples for terrestrial crustaceans? Could that be like a crab? Like they do both water and land? So there are arboreal crabs, crabs that only live on trees. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah, right. The coconut crab is a good example. And then actually I have um, seen certain crabs that only breeds inside tree cavities on uh, like like on a tree live tree right that's the only place they have a, uh, they occur and breed so they need water but they don't go to actual water they go to weird types of water coconut uh, tree crab is actually like living in on uh, tree canopies right it's really weird there are crayfish living on the stream banks they don't go to the actual water right they, if, if they go that's a, like catch food not for breathing right they actually depend on the moisture um, in tree bank holes for respiration. They don't have gills. They, they actually have, they, they have gills, not lungs. So they need moisture for respiration, but they don't go actually into water, right? So there are some crustaceans that are terrestrial, right? Okay. Um, so respiration for insects, they actually have something called the tracheal system, right? Which kind of Analogous to lung, but you know, much more complex than a lung, um, or, or functions different from a lung. And crustaceans have what for respiration? Gills. So those are some examples for uh, differences. What do they have in common? Now you said antennae. Well, you can say they both have antennae, right? That's something they have in common, right? They have highly differentiated uh, paired appendages for different functions. That's another thing common for both of them, right? Sexes are separate. That's another thing common to both of them. Um, now, do uh, they both have um, some sort of segment separation, right? Or tagmatization, right? You know, insects, they have head, thorax, abdomen. Crustaceans have cephalothorax and the abdomen, right? So. Those are actually good features you can uh, consider as uh, common features. Now, here's what I don't want you to use as common features. Any feature that is common to any animal, like triploblastic, they have coelomes. They don't have cell walls. They are multicellular. Please don't list those, right? Think about as specific as possible when you're listing common features, right? Um, so I would, I mean, you might ask, um, how about jointed appendage? How about an exoskeleton? Well, those are unique to those two as well as any arthropod, right? So pick features that are actually common to those two, but might be distinct from other classes of the same phylum, right? That's how I do it, right? So my, I will award full credits for anything that's actually um, very much unique to the, the to the examples I have given, right? Um, I actually, you, you know, just unique between those two classes, right? But uh, not shared within the phylum, right? If you give anything that is phylum level, I will consider partial credits. But if you put anything that is animal level, I will not give you credits, okay? And the last part of that homework is, is, is that clear? Any, any question you want to follow up with that homework? 
Okay, last part is actually much more easier um, regarding um, list the common and scientific names of at least two species of crustaceans and two species of insects. Now, let me ask you a question. Which one of is an insect, right? Um, either scream out or uh, do you uh, like, you know, up or down, right? Spiders, are they insects? Correct, no, right? Scorpions, are they insects? Yeah, I, I, I see this. Yes, correct. You are right. It's not an insect. Ticks. Like they do in movies. Ticks are like spiders. They have eight legs. Don't believe me? Check out next time you pick one. <laughs> right? Um, mites. Not insects. Bees, butterflies, book lice. Yes, yeah, right. Anything with three legs are insects, right? Um, and then, well, crustacean, you know that, right? I mean, like, but what, what you should not, here's what you should not list. Don't say bees. What kind of bees are we talking about? European honeybee, African honeybee, right? North American sweat bees, they're like billion sweat bees too, right? Uh, uh, ground nesting bees, like yeah, be mention the, the actual species, common name and English name, right? And then um, how about crustaceans? Well, North American lobster. Yeah, uh, Emily, you were about to say something. You, 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 um... Yeah, should we also list our source? No, no, not at all. I don't really care where you are getting it from. I can help you where to get the information from. Animal Diversity Web is extremely useful to get this kind of information from. ADW, Animal Diversity Web. It's a website created and maintained by, uh, I think either Michigan State or University of Michigan. Um, any museum websites are extremely useful for this kind of research. But I don't want you to mention the source. You can check with me through email uh, if this source is credible, but no, you don't have to. Um, crustaceans, North American lobster, like I mean, examples I can go on, like rusty spotted uh, crayfish, like, like that, go for any actual crustacean, any crab you pick, right? Hermit crab, right? Um, things like that. So, da, 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 da. I mean, those are a few examples. Those are not the only things, right? And um, and then we ask you to mention its classification, right? Um, so what are we looking for in terms of classification? Common name, scientific name, and the taxon level, right? So you are, since it's insects, you are going to stuff like that. Species name, genera, or genus name, family, order, right? And the order is actually insecta. And some students I usually get even above. I don't want you to do that. Some people even go like, go up to like phylum, um, uh, subphylum, like, no, I don't expect you to do that. So you only go from insects to species, right? Order, insecta to species, whatever you pick, right? Um, well, that's actually it about this particular ectodosoan homework. Now let's look at the homework for Lophotrochozoans. Uh, let's actually download that and go over that. Uh, homework. There you go, that one. And I will share the screen for this one. All right, now here again, very similar in structure, guys. Um, Quahog, it's actually the, the, the clam you are dissecting, earthworm and the planaria, right? Scientific names, um, I have given the Quahog scientific name, planaria, it's Dugesia, I have given that too. Earthworm is also given in uh, my second PowerPoint, right? So uh, I will always make sure to provide you with that. Right. Dugesia, I don't, I think I mentioned Dugesia species. I don't mention the genus. Um, phylum, speak with me, answer me. What is a phylum, guys, for planaria? Uh, 
What is the phylum for Planaria? Platyhelminthes. is correct. Earthworm. Oligo. That is not the phylum, right? Oligochaeta is the class. Phylum is what? Annelid. Very correct. Annelida. Quahog. Phylum? Mollusk. Very good. Um, feeding type. Quahog. How do they feed? Method of feeding. How do they obtain food? Filter feed. Filter feed is correct. And what kind of structures do they use for filter feeding and digestion? The siphons. Well, think from, yeah, you, very good. You started with the excurrent and incurrent siphon. And then what else? Gills. Yeah. Very good, gills. And then what? Intestine. Ah, uh, before intestine? Mouth. Mouth. Intestine, right? Um, and anus. And yeah, and of course, they also have digestive glands, right? Because they, they need to digest the part, th stuff that they eat. Um, and then, of course, let's earthworm. How do they, what kind of uh, field, uh, feeding type do they have? It's okay to make a mistake. This is actually the time that you, you, you actually, you know, learn by making a mistake. How do they feed? Would they be considered uh, not not scavengers, but that's uh, not a bad way to look at. Uh, yeah, I I know what you mean. You are, you are hesitant to say scavengers. You are right, uh, but you are close. Detritivore. They eat decaying organic matter, right? Um, so, so detritivo is the correct answer for that. And what kind of digestive uh, like systems do they have? Protostome. Yeah, they actually, sorry? Say that one more time. Somebody said something, I didn't hear it. Oh, come on. <laughs> Well, I said protostome, but... No, protostome is actually not a feeding structure, right? Protostome and deuterostome is a, how development happens. I bet you are trying to say pro, pro, the, the the first segment, right? The, yeah. The thing before the first segment, right? No, that actually does not help in feeding, right? So it's actually the mouth. Start with the mouth, right? Always start with the mouth, right? Mouth and then um, label every organ that is coming through, right? Esophagus, well, you can say pharynx, and then esophagus, then crop, right? Then gizzard, then intestine, then anus, right? Done, right? And then um, how do um, planarians, right? What is their, how do you describe their um, feeding style? The only non-parasitic form of platyhelminthes? So also filter feeding? They don't filter feed. They actually are scavengers, right? They, they scavenge largely dead animal stuff, right? Little to do with dead plant stuff, largely dead animal stuff. Like you can feed them meat. Like when people culture planaria, planaria is a wonderful animal, guys. What happens if you cut a planaria in two halves? Don't they become two separate organisms? they become two completely separate organisms, right? They actually are extremely good at regeneration. Um, and in fact, so people study planaria, they actually feed them um, like liver extraction, right? They, they, they do really well with that. So they are scavengers. And can someone label me their digestive parts? Isn't it just the mouth? And? Um Pharynx. Correct. And? Intestine? Um, it... I, yeah, you can call it intestine. I'm not against it, by, but you can call it. Yeah, this three, you, you can be specific. Three branched intestine. Or if you don't like the word intestine because it's not complete, you can call it three branched gastrovascular cavity. Right? Um. Alrighty, so respiration, what does quahog has for respiration? Uh, 
gills. They do have gills. How do they draw water into the gills? Using what? The siphons. Siphons. So you have to mention both of them. And then earthworm, how do they respire? And how do planaria respire? Uh, diffusion through their outer covering. Diffusion through their outer covering. You can say di diffusion through outer covering. You can also say uh, skin. Yeah, that's also fine. Integument is also acceptable answer. Actually, a correct, you know, much better scientific answer. Movement. Quahog moves primarily with their foot. Correct. Earthworm. Uh, longitudinal and circular muscle, muscles. Ex excellent. Rather than saying muscles, mention both. And remember what else do they have coming out of their skin that helps them to latch on to as they move around? The tiny hairs. Yeah, CT, correct. CT, CT. Again, I, I don't care how you pronounce it. Planaria. This is something I didn't explain very much. How do you think they actually move? Uh, muscles. They do have, yeah, I showed that in my dissect, my, my cross section, they do have muscles, so you're right. And they also, on from the underside, which you see in my um, uh, diagram, is actually they have cilia. And also the epithelium in the underside secretes mucus. Both of those, cilia and the mucus collectively helps locomotion, right? So there are three structures, muscles, cilia, mucus. Um, and how do quahog maintain, uh, like, uh, like, I would like to have multiple interactions. I usually see same three uh, few people uh, involving. Again, please be wrong. That's fine. I, I do appreciate greatly. Big round of applause to those who actually keep uh, ask, answering my questions. Um, do make mistakes. I, I, I love when even if you give a wrong answer, because I can tell you why it is wrong. Um, structures for body, maintaining body shape. What kind of structure do quahog? The bival has for that. Come on, you know this. Hey, here's a deal. If I don't get an answer, I stop going over homework. How do they maintain their body shape? Quahog. They have a serum. Sorry, uh, they have a coelom, you're right, but actually there is something much more stronger that they actually keep their body shape. Is what do you say? Shell secreted by the mantle, right? 100% correct, 100% correct. Um, uh, um, yeah. When we when you answer, like, you know, you, you might feel like somebody is actually speaking over you because they don't, you know, like usually it's harder to see, like it's completely okay. It's don't take it uh, um, too seriously, but but uh, try to be very, you know, like flexible so that, you know, like if someone is actually speaking, let them finish and then you can answer, okay? Um, shell, 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 shell. And then, so it is actually the shell, yeah. And earthworm, what do they have for that? Now, Randolph's answer. Uh, yeah, correct. The coelom is actually what they, uh, what they have. And you can also say hydrostatic skeleton produced by coelom. That is also a correct answer. Um, planaria, do they have anything to maintain their body shape? Could you say the muscles do? Yeah, but muscles... <sighs> do help to maintain the body shape to as, as long as there is a skeletal system. Otherwise, like, you know, like, you know, muscles themselves cannot help maintain the body shape, right? I mean, you might think, wait, 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 those, those biceps, um, uh, uh, pecs, don't they have a shape? Yes, as long as there is something that they attach to, right? For these guys, the muscles are attached to the body covering, right? They don't actually have an actual skeletal system. So, uh, for planaria, what kind of sensory systems uh, do we see? There are, I'll give you help. There are two very clear sensory systems in planaria. Eye spots. Correct. Two. Second one. They have like those antenna looking things. I forgot what you said they were called. I know what you're, that those are oracles. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, sex separate. Which organism has sex separate? Which organism does not? 
Pa hog. Do they have uh, uh, separate males and female individuals? Um, yes. Correct, they do. Um, earthworms, are mm. they? They have like, they don't have them separated. That is also correct. So earthworms are hermaphroditic. So are planarians, right? Um, now, and then um, internal or uh, external fertilization. How do fertilization happen in quahog and um, earthworm? So internal is what? When sperms fertilize eggs inside the female's body, right? If it is anywhere, if, if, if it is outside, anywhere outside, it's external. So which one is internal? Which one is external? What do you think? I think the quah hog would be internal. Right? Um, anyone, any other different answer? Um, so that would be external then. No, no, for the other one, for the earthworm, I, I meant. Um, the earthworm is internal as well. Okay, so you, uh, I, I hear two, and uh, I hear one answer from Annie, and she says both are internal. Well, um, you might have not heard. I did not mention this um directly. Quah hog or bivalves, uh, most of the bivalves, actually all bivalves, what they do is when they reproduce, they release sperms to water, right? And and, and sperms, and, and the sperms start swimming here and there, and then actually, um, and the eggs are also released to the environment, right? So, yeah, those <laughs> happens like, I mean, you, you can watch videos, you can see as if like dust emitting from this animal's body when they're actually, you know, reproducing. So the fertilization external. X goes out, sperms goes out, fertilize, you get the larvae. You get the, of course, the zygote and the zygote becomes larvae, right? So thinking point would be actually that um, most of the time, most of the time when you have a larvae, chances are you are looking at an external fertilized organism. Most of, sorry? I just had a quick question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me finish what I was saying. Okay. Most of the time, if there's a larval stage, you would be looking at externally fertilized individuals. And we might come up with examples that's contrary to the fact. Uh, go with, to your question, Annie. So I was gonna ask, are like most aquatic, um, well, not most, but some of them, like, uh, like I can automatically think of like a salmon, you know, like they do their migration thingy and then they, the females lay eggs and then they're fertilized externally. Um, is that like, that would be an example of that. Anyway. You are 100% correct. That's 100% correct. Salmons are an example for external fertilization. Okay. 100%. Most fish are actually, you know, um, okay. external fertilizers. Yeah. Ex sharks are the ones that are not. Sharks, internal fertilization. Sharks actually have like, you know, in their fins, they have, male sharks has, you know, two pointy things um, for internal fertilization. So. Um, you are right, Annie, with that. You are right for an example. Uh, earthworm is also external. Remember what happens? Eggs and sperms are released into the cocoon, right? So, right. First, yeah, sperms inserted into the, into the female reproductive system, right? And then that female inserts all of that and the eggs to the cocoon. Fertilization happens in the cocoon. Like it's it's really important to understand because you may think, wait, 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 wait. You said that eggs are inserted, uh, sperms are inserted to the other worm. I said that, yes, but fertilization doesn't happen there. Fertilization only happens inside the cocoon, which is external. So both of them are example for external fertilization. Um, circulation, which one has the open, which one has the closed? Quahog has closed. Uh, so, um, so actually, it's again the opposite. Quahog, right, has open circulatory system. Remember, quahog is a muscle. Muscles have this secondary cavity in addition to the coelom, right? So there should be a mechanism to fill that secondary blood space, right? That's why they have an open circulation system. Earthworm closed circulation system. Remember which one had like actual vessels in the dissection? 
right? Those dorsal vessels, ventral vessels, right? Aortic arches, that is the earthworm. So closed circulatory system like us. Open circulatory system is actually um, quahog. What kind of circulatory organs did we see in a quahog? Did we see a heart? That's correct. To be honest, in the dissection, that is all I showed you, right? But if I showed you a diagram, like there is a mechanism to deliver blood to the heart, so they have blood vessels and a heart, right? And some you can also argue the uh, hemocele, like, well, well, where blood goes to, to the hemocele, shouldn't I consider that? Hmm, I don't disagree, but at least mention heart and vessels, right? Earthworm. Let's see what, what do you guys think? What kind of arches? Ah, brilliant. Or oh, you can say hearts, not heart, hearts, right? What else? Blood vessels. Yeah, again, there are two types of blood vessels, right? Single dorsal blood vessel and ventral blood vessels, because there were there could be multiple, right? Um, and then very similar Venn diagram on the opposite side. Um, you know, again, um, mercenaria and lumbricus, right? So you are looking at, um, again, the uniquenesses and the differences, right? So, you know, um, what kind of examples would you come up with? Um, can we start listing common things that are common to both of them? What do you think? What do you think what's common to both of them? Do they both have sebums? Hmm, good, very good answer. Um, come on, let me let me quickly show you the, those two organisms that might actually help. So mercenaria is the quahog, right? Um, and then the lumbicus, you know, that's the earthworm, right? So, um, now, yes, so the coelom is actually an answer that I am hearing, and that's actually correct, right? Coelom is, presence of coelom, right? Is actually common to both of them. What else do you guys want to mention? Uh, quahog, the bivalve, and the earthworm. They both have muscles. Excellent. They, they have muscular structures. Yeah, of course. Uh, what else? So the muscles one, I would actually mention it might fit better as a difference because here's the point. Remember, like, you know, um, there are other animal groups in other phyla that had muscles, right? Um, so I would mention for the lumbricus, both longitudinal and circular muscles, right? For the um, uh, area or the quahog, you can say has uh, abductor and retractor muscles, right? Um, and you can say for opening and closing the valves for that one. And for the lumbricus, you can say for movements, right? For the animal level movements. Um, what else guys you can mention in terms of differences or similarities between those two animals? Um, difference is um, one has a hard outer shell, the other is soft. Yes, harder versus softer uh, uh, external skeleton, right? I mean, you can say actually, you can go even better. Mercenaria, exoskeleton present. One, you know, present as two halves, right? You can be as precise as that lumbricus, no exoskeleton, just outer body covering, softer body covering, great. Um, so remember we talked about the circulatory system just a second ago, can we think about a difference? Um, one's open. Aha, the other is closed. There we go. Um, so that's another difference. Uh, anything else you want to mention? We talked a lot. How about one more thing about circulatory system? 
what was pumping blood in those critters. Blood pumping in the earthworm was by what? Aortic arches. Correct. And blood pumping in uh, mercenaria was by? Heart. A single heart, right? Single heart, right. Yeah, correct. So like that, there are so many uh, things that you can list. Um, and the bottom one, let's actually share the screen again. Uh, yeah. Um, going to the bottom, this one right now. Um, so here, this one, uh, what you first do is between planaria and the earthworm, right? Um, you are going to list certain organ systems that are actually um, common to both of them, right? And then two more organ systems that are actually unique to just one of them, right? Um, so don't list organs. We are asking for organ systems. Now, let me help you out over here. Do both of them have digestive systems? Earthworm and planaria. Did both of them have digestive systems or not? Yes. Yeah, they had both, both of them have. So that's one example of common to both of them, right? Um, do both of them have some sort of a sensory system? or a nervous system, you can say, because sensory system is part of the nervous system. What do you think? Yeah, they both of them do, right? They, they both have sensory systems, right? Why, how do you know? Planaria, I didn't show you a nervous system. Well, but you know that they're sensitive to light. They move away from the light, right? Um, um, and I mentioned they actually have those eye spots and those auricles. So there should be a system to interpret those signals and they do. Um, and then how about circulatory systems and respiratory systems? Um, do both, which one has a circulatory system? The earthworms. Only the earthworms. How about a respiratory system? Which one had respiratory systems? Is it considered only the earthworms? Because the, um, can't think of, when well, the stars of the P, um, doesn't actually have like, any structures because it just uses diffusion through the skin? Yeah, so that's actually a good point. Um, now we are asking a respiratory system, not a respiratory organ, right? So skin is a respiratory organ, not a respiratory system. So neither of them have respiratory systems, right? Skeleton, how about skeleton? Which one has a skeleton? Which one does not? That's actually arguable. So exoskeleton, which one has an exoskeleton clearly? Neither. Oh, excellent answer. Neither of them have an exoskeleton. How about other form of skeleton? Hydrostatic skeleton, which one has a hydrostatic skeleton? Lumbricus has a sea loam. Yep, so Lumbricus has a coelom. So you, you can actually mention, you know, like exoskeleton, neither does. Um, uh, uh, hydrostatic skeleton, lum, Lumbricus or the earthworm does, right? Um, yeah, so basically, actually, I think that's, uh, and then the other question is like, why and why not? I mean, generally, why not? is the answer to why not part is actually, if the organism is simple, if their lifestyle is simple, right? You know, like if, if it relates to their lifestyle, right? Relates to their body form, right? Relate to their complexity, right? So, so think about those when you try to answer why they have a system, why they don't have a system, right? Uh, or do they have a particular structure that does multiple functions and their body is so simple, they don't need elaborative systems. So that's actually how you argue reasons for having or not having one. Okay, guys, um, that's basically it. We still have some time. If you have any questions for me, this is the time for that. Um, so, da -da 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 -da. yeah, any questions for me? All right, guys. So last thing I want to mention is uh, I got a quick question. Um, Shoot, yeah, go. Cool. On, on that paper, it said that the uh, lab was going to be due before class instead of uh, eleven fifty nine. Is that 
No, uh, Randolph, like I, the reason why it is like that is because um, when we were meeting in person, we collected it when you walked in. But now it's not. It is always, like I mentioned in the very first one, always every homework is due 11.59 p.m. So that's why actually, you know, I always let you guys ask questions on the last day off. Right. So like, you know, today you can ask questions. So, yeah, always, um, guys, uh, it, it's not due before. Would we put first section on the paper? It's always something I've been wondering. Your section is seven. Um, but you, you guys are the only section I teach. So even if you don't put anything, that's fine. But just for you to know, it's section seven. Um, if I already submitted it, but want to make changes with the information we went over, can I submit another one? Absolutely, yes. Anyone who thinks they actually have better ways to do that, you know, you learn down the road, like, you know, like, yeah. Uh, the Blackboard is set for automatic uh, acceptance of answers. If you had a trouble, just let me know. I will clear your existing attempt and let you resubmit it. Not a problem at all. Thank you. Yeah. For, that, for, for those who actually get the first attempt right before the deadline, but kind of realized they didn't do it right after the deadline, I will still accept the um, um, the submission because officially you submitted it first, right? You, it is the second one that you forgot. So, so you are not late, right? So I, still I will accept it even if it is late because it takes me how long I need to grade. Always I will grade them back within a week, right? If I stay healthy, <laughs> uh, unintubated, even if not healthy, <laughs> I will make sure uh, I will grade them because you need to know how good you are doing, right? That helps a lot to um, decide stuff, right? Um, I wanted to make sure, yeah, I think that's it actually. We have, um, yeah, we still actually have a student missing again. Um, we should see 11 people because there are 10 students. So I'm only seeing 10 of us, including me. Um, yeah, I, I, I asked her to join another group. I believe it's Kayla's group that I um, asked her to join to, but she will communicate with you. Um, so make yeah, sure- I got in touch with her, yeah. Yeah, very good, great. She has trouble with her Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, it, it's extremely uh, unavoidable. That's probably why she, she's not here right now. Uh, do try to reach out to her. Um, communicate with her like and I do communicate with your um, teammates. So that's all going well. Any question regarding any of those things so far? All right, guys, I'm going to cut you loose. All right. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Of course. Bye. Thank you. Have a bye. Great bye. Time. Yeah. Just do. Bye.